and she got her BA from Colorado College, her MS in biology from the University of New Mexico. Um, and she and her family live in Wiley City where they have multiple animals and bees and gardens and they love being outside. Claire um, is both a poet and a teacher and she loves the challenge of explaining things so that her students and her audience really understand them. She's given us five, this is her fifth presentation for us and we are so grateful for that because we always feel like we understand things better when she's through. Just occurred to me today that Claire brings us clarity and we really appreciate that. Now we know why she's called Claire. Anyway, thanks Claire for being here. Thank you, Mary Lou. Um, my students, you know, they often say, oh, excuse me, can you, can you clarify this question? And I'm like, yeah, to clarify, to make more clear like. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. I always enjoy the opportunity to come and talk to you guys. You're a great audience. And I also really like the um, excuse to um, dig in deep to the literature and try to organize things in a way that hopefully hopefully is understandable. I should remind you that I'm not a healthcare provider and nothing I say should be taken as medical advice. But I do have a job where I get a lot of practice in taking complicated things and trying to simplify it and make it understandable and hopefully interesting. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do today. So let's start by just kind of putting COVID into a larger scale perspective. According to the World Health Organization, as of late September, 2021, there've been about 232 million confirmed cases and 5 million confirmed deaths from COVID. These are, this is almost certainly an undercount. We know not everybody who gets COVID gets tested. We know that not all deaths are correctly attributed to COVID. So these numbers should be considered just an absolute minimum number of people that have been infected or, or who have died. Um, but we can still just use those as ballpark and, and say, how does that compare to other pandemics through history? I used this image in an earlier presentation with you guys last July. And at that point, there had been about 500,000 deaths from COVID. And at that point, I was kind of making the case that tragic as that was, it was hardly on the radar compared to other pandemic pandemics through time. But it has been a lot of, it's been a while since then and COVID has really continued to, to spread and continue to, to kill people. And so we're now at significantly higher deaths that are now putting us not at the top of the plagues through time, but certainly in the running. And you can see that HIV AIDS has killed somewhere between 25 and 35 million people. Um, Spanish flu, which in the 1918 flu pandemic that COVID-19 gets compared to a lot, that killed something like 40 to 50 million people, it was much more deadly than COVID-19, killed a much larger proportion of the people it infected. Um, we can see smallpox and the Black Death and some of the plagues farther back in, in history also killed more people. And considering that there were fewer people alive at those times, those were still more significant than COVID-19 in terms of the proportion of the people of the world that, that were affected. But still, 5 million confirmed deaths means COVID-19 is, is getting on the map in terms of deadly pandemics through time. And we're not out of the woods yet. So. The, the World Health Organization is a really interesting organization for tracking um, COVID-19. This is where I got my numbers from. I have to now share the screen here. Okay, so th this is the World Health Organization COVID tracker. So it keeps daily counts of how many confirmed cases and deaths there are. So that's where my numbers came from. You can also see that there have been these waves of cases and deaths over time. And we can look more specifically at where in the world those cases are occurring. So some of the earlier waves were predominantly the Americas and Europe. And some parts of the world like Southeast Asia had very few cases in those early, early months of the pandemic, but have now seen surges more, more recently. 
So different parts of the world have been differently impacted by COVID at different points in the pandemic. You can also zoom in by country. And so this graph shows the United States um, starting in 2019 before we had any cases at all. And you can see cases increased. There was this real spike of cases in this is November of 2020. So through the fall and winter of last year, cases were really high, things shut down, things were pretty scary. And then as spring came, um, the cases really dropped. People were starting to get vaccinated. People were spending more time outside. And we know that COVID is much more rarely transmitted when people are, are outside. And so um, as we went into the beginning part of the summer, it was really seeming like things might be getting back to normal. Restaurants were opening up. Just th things seemed much more normal. But then in late summer, what we saw this second big wave of cases and they actually got higher than they'd been in the worst, worst months of last winter. And then in the last couple of weeks, they have dropped off quite significantly, although they're still pretty high if you look at the overall pattern. And, um, and in some, some parts of the country are, are higher than others. So the United States is still very much in the midst of, of a wave of COVID cases. Okay. Okay, if we zoom in more specifically into the Yakima County, the Yakima County website reports that there's been about 42,000 cases in Yakima County since the beginning of the pandemic. There have been more than 500 people who have died. And as of yesterday, there were 36 people that were hospitalized, um, currently hospitalized. And that's down from where it was a few weeks ago, but still enough that hospitals are sort of staggering under the, the, the need to take care of these COVID patients while still maintaining other care. And with a infection rate of, of 866 new cases per 100,000 people, that's in the last 14 days, that is still puts us in the high community transmission category. And so even as cases have declined across the US as a whole, it, and to some extent in Yakima, we're still very much in the midst of a, a COVID wave. And, and so COVID is really relevant right now. There's been a lot of interest in where COVID-19 came from. We're pretty sure it came out of bats, that, that probably horseshoe bats that bats have a lot of different coronaviruses, including the, the closest known viruses to SARS-CoV-2. That's the official name of the COVID-19 pandemic is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but that's quite a mouthful. So I'm mostly just gonna call it the COVID virus. So yeah, the COVID virus almost certainly originated in bats, but um, we, don't, we have not found COVID-19, that particular virus in bats that the closest viruses we found in bats appear to be cousins that have been evolving separately for something like 30 years. So um, it's possible that we just haven't sampled the right bat yet and that somewhere out there is a bat that actually has the COVID vaccine, COVID virus, and that people got infected directly from bats. So that is one possible way that the pandemic got started. Probably a more likely scenario is that bats infected some intermediate species. And this could be pangolins. We know they have some viruses that seem similar to the, the COVID virus, um, but we haven't found the exact COVID virus in pangolins either. So it may be that we haven't sampled the right pangolin or it may be that it's some other species that was the intermediate species. And so that the virus might've gotten into some intermediate species, changed, um, basically mutated, evolved there for a while and then from that intermediate species infected people in Wuhan. There is also the possibility that it was a lab leak, that there is a virology institute in Wuhan. This um, microbiology lab does study bat coronaviruses. They have sampled coronaviruses from bats from around China. They have maintained them in the lab. They have performed experiments on them where they modify the virus to to explore what makes a coronavirus more or less infectious to people. So it is a possibility that viruses leaked out of 
the Wuhan lab or one like it and infected people. You can either, either a wild virus that they were maintaining in the lab or a modified virus that they had experimented on. Um, if you look in the dark corners of the internet, you can find lots of conspiracy theories that it was an intentional bio warfare release. I don't think there's much serious scientific um, scientific evidence for that. Almost certainly if it did leak out of the lab, it was an accidental leak and that probably what happened is that a lab worker was infected and then infected other people. We don't know which of these hypotheses is the true story of where COVID-19 came from. And China is making it very difficult to investigate the origins. And so we may never know. Probably most scientists think that this infection of via an intermediate species is the most likely scenario. But all three of these are possibilities. And it may be eventually we'll find out, or it may be that we'll never know for sure where this pandemic started. But if we assume that, that via an intermediate host route is the, is the one most likely scenario, then that would show, that's what this picture basically shows, that the bats were probably the original natural host. And then it got into pangolins or some other intermediate host and evolved there for a while. And then it infected people. And then it spread around the world as people infected each other. And then from people, it got into a variety of other animals. So there are reports of dogs and cats getting infected from their owners. There have been lions and tigers infected in zoos. COVID-19 got into mink farms, spread rapidly through the mink farms, and then did end up reinfecting people from mink. And that led to massive culling of millions of mink um, in Northern Europe. And then it's also been found in deer populations in the United States. And what this means is that we're never gonna see the end of COVID-19, at least not in the foreseeable future, because it's not just in people. And so we won't vaccinate our way out of it. We, we won't isolate our way out of it. There's always the possibility that even if we manage to get rid of all the human cases, since it's now found in animal populations, it could always get back into humans from, from animals. So we're gonna have to learn to live with COVID-19 because we're never gonna get rid of it entirely. And since we're gonna have to learn to live with it, we should know as much about it as we can. So I thought I would review some of the basic biology of COVID-19. So um, from previous talks, you might remember that viruses in general are composed of a piece of nucleic acid, a piece of genetic material. This is either RNA or DNA. And with, with COVID, it's RNA. And then that is surrounded by a protein coat called a capsid. And then in some viruses, and that includes COVID, that is surrounded by an outer layer called an envelope that's really a piece of our cell membrane that the virus picked up on its way out. And embedded in that, vent, that envelope are these viral proteins called spikes. And in coronaviruses, those spikes are kind of club-shaped and that's why this group is called coronaviruses because the spikes give them a kind of crown-like appearance when you look at them under a microscope, under, with an electron microscope. Those spikes are what COVID uses to get into our cells. So the spikes on the virus bind to a protein on our cell membranes called ACE2. And that is a protein, its normal function is to, um, be involved in blood pressure regulation. So it's found on a bunch of our cells because its job is to regulate blood pressure. And um, the coronavirus binds to that and then gets into our cells. And then the genetic material, the RNA, gets removed from the virus and it gets used as instructions for making proteins. And if you remember, basic general biology from, from high school or college, then you might remember that ribosomes are the protein factories of cells. And so what this genetic material is doing is it's going to our cells ribosomes and it's using those ribosomes to make the viral proteins. And so that would be the capsids, that outer coat. It would also be some enzymes that the virus uses to copy the RNA, to make more copies of that original RNA. 
And then the virus uses our cell machinery, our Golgi body, to, to assemble these new viral particles to get the, the RNA inside the capsids and to pick up an envelope. And then the viruses get released and they're off to infect additional cells. Um, there's a lot of these ACE2 receptors on the, the lung cells. And so lungs often bear the brunt of COVID-19 infection. The picture on the right here, this is a healthy lung. And what you can see is there's lots of empty space. These are air sacs that, that fill with air and these very thin walls let the oxygen diffuse across and into the bloodstream. So this is a lung that has thin membranes that can allow gas exchange to occur. If a lung gets infected with COVID, then the infected cells trigger an immune response. And so we get white blood cells arriving at the scene. And so these little purple dots, these are white blood cells. And so they arrive at the scene and they start attacking the virally infected cells. And they send out chemical signals calling for more white blood cells. And so more white blood cells arrive at the scene. And some of those chemical signals actually damage the, the tissue. And so these beautiful empty air sacs start filling up with white blood cells and damaged cells and scar tissue and, and fluid. And it becomes much more difficult to get a good exchange of, of gases. And this is what leads to the shortness of breath or the respiratory difficulties that people who get severe COVID have. But there are ACE2 receptors on lots of other organs in the body as well. And so COVID is not just a respiratory condition. There are ACE2 receptors in the intestines. And so um, some people with COVID get diarrhea. Um, COVID can impact the blood vessels and lead to inappropriate blood clotting. It can in impact the central nervous system, the, the brain, and that can lead to headaches and confusion, brain fog. And in severe cases, things like meningitis. A very common phenomenon with COVID is loss of smell as it infects the cells in the, the nasal passages. It can impact the heart and cause inflammation of the heart. So it can have wide range of effects on the body. As physicians have had more experience with COVID, we've gotten better at treating some of these symptoms. So we know better when and how to use supplemental oxygen or ventilators to reduce the lung effects. And we can keep people hydrated to avoid the harmful effects of diarrhea. And we can give them anticoagulants to prevent inappropriate clotting. There's not much we can do for the brain fog or the loss of smell, but we can prevent some of the heart inflammation by dampening down the immune response. And so some of the most successful treatments for COVID have just been reducing the immune response. And so reducing the damage that the immune system does to our body while it's trying to fight the, the virus. So um, immunosuppressant medications like dextamethasone have been effective in helping people with severe COVID by just reducing the extra damage that the overactive immune response produces. So we've made progress in treating COVID, but we do not yet have anything that would really be considered a cure or even a, a great treatment. Um, what we need is things that are cheap and readily available and easy to administer, and ideally that actually prevent the, the virus itself from replicating as opposed to just treating the responses, the immune responses and the damage that it does. And um, scientists and physicians are still really working on this. The World Health Organization has just reopened a series of trials on different medications to try to find other meds that will help treat COVID. All right, so what's with all those Greek letters? On the, a couple of slides ago, I showed that the RNA had to, has to be replicated to make new COVID viruses. The RNA has to be copied and sometimes when that copying happens, it, it doesn't happen exactly right. You get changes in the RNA. So we call those changes mutation. And so over time, mutations occur that make the virus a little bit different than, it, or than the original strain. And sometimes those mutations might give the 
virus an advantage. And if it does, then that virus will then spread. And if this sounds a lot like evolution, that's because it is. This is evolution in our time. This is COVID-19 um, viruses are evolving um, during this pandemic. And it's fundamentally the same process as you know, examples from textbooks. Like in this, in this picture, we have variation in mice coat color. And we see that predators pick the mice, eat the mice that they are most able to see. And that over time, those mice that have favorable characteristics survive and reproduce. Or you could tell a, a similar kind of story with variation in giraffe neck length. And those that can reach higher get more food and survive and reproduce. And over time, longer necks spreads through the population. Like these kind of stories about how evolution works are fundamentally what's happening with COVID-19. There's variation because of these mutations. And some of that variation produces advantages that lets the, the virus that has those, variant, vari those mutations um, spread through the population. And we can see this happening in India in this graph showing the different strains that were um, occurring in India in the beginning of the year. So all the different colors represent different strains of COVID-19. And so you can see there was a lot of variation. These All these different strains are just versions that have slightly different mutations um, of the from the original virus. And what happened um, as, the, as winter turned into spring is one particular strain really took off and pretty quickly it outcompeted all the other strains and became the dominant strain. Um, it spread through the viral population and became the dominant strain. This was the Delta strain. And when it became prevalent, this corresponded with um, this corresponded with the big peak in cases and deaths that was in the news in, um, from India in the spring and summer, where we were seeing headlines about Indian hospitals running out of medication and um, running out of oxygen and people dying in the streets, like trying to get admitted to hospitals that weren't letting any more people in because they didn't have any oxygen. So this was the real tragedy in India was, a, was occurring as that Delta strain was becoming more prominent in the population. So clearly, Delta had an advantage that let it outcompete the other strains. So let's just back up for a minute and think about what kinds of advantages could we be talking about when we're talking about um, evolution of viruses? Well, one possibility is that a, a advantage, one advantage that a mutation might provide is it might make the virus more transmissible. Respiratory viruses in general can tra be transmitted by these larger drops when somebody coughs or sneezes or talks. You get these larger droplets that tend to fall out of the air pretty quickly and so mostly infect people nearby. Or you get these smaller aerosols that can travel much farther through the air and so can infect people farther out. Um, you could imagine a virus acquiring mutations that allowed it maybe to spread more readily through those little droplets. And so it could spread to people farther away from the infected person. Another possible thing, and at this point, we're just sort of throwing out ideas of what kinds of advantages could, could occur. We're not saying that any one of these is actually happening, but we're just thinking about how um, new characteristics might make a virus more likely to spread. Um, some viruses are transmitted through contaminated surfaces. We call those surfaces fomites. And so um, COVID primarily is not transmitted this way. There's not a lot of people getting infected from doorknobs or, or um, stairway rails or things like that. But you could imagine a virus getting a mutation that allowed it to survive longer on surfaces and therefore be able to spread more readily because it was hanging out on doorknobs and, and things like that. Another thing that could lead, lead a virus to be more transmissible might be just that it has mutations that make it make more copies in you. So in general, if you are making more copies of the virus, you are going to be more able to infect other people than if you have fewer copies of the virus. So the higher the viral load, the more infectious a, the person is. And so if a virus has mutations that makes it make more copies of the virus more rapidly, then it will be able, 
likely to be able to be spread more readily. So those are just some kinds of ideas of advantages that could make a virus more transmissible. That idea of high viral load is also important for um, virulence. In general, the more viruses in the body, the more likely you are to get seriously sick. And so as a higher transmissibility evolves, sometimes that also leads to more virulence evolving. Because if, if the virus is becoming more transmissible by increasing the dose of viruses, then that's probably also going to make the people who get it sicker. Sometimes the, the way the virus damages our body can also lead to more spread. So if the virus spreads through coughing and sneezing and it makes you cough and sneeze more, you know, you're going to be sicker and it's going to be more likely to spread. Um, not, diseases don't always evolve to be more virulent because if you get too sick, then you might not get out there and spread it or you might die before you have a chance to spread it. And so virulence by itself does not necessarily provide an advantage to the virus. But because virulence and transmissibility are tied, then often things that make the virus more transmissible will also make it more likely to damage you because it's associated with a higher viral load or because it's associated with um, symptoms that both make you sicker and make it more likely to spread, like coughing and sneezing and things like that. And then the other big advantage that I'm going to talk about more later in the talk is the, the virus might accumulate mutations that let it avoid your immune system more. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about um, accumulating mutations that it'll let, let you avoid your immune system even after you've already been vaccinated for the original strain. So that idea of immune escape could be an advantage that a virus has if it could infect people even who have already had been infected by earlier versions of the virus, then that would be an advantage from the point of view of the virus. This, by the way, is what happens with the flu, that the flu evolves much more rapidly than COVID does. And so the reason you can get the flu every year and the reason that you need a, a different flu shot every year is because the flu virus is constantly evolving in ways that lets it escape the immune response you developed for the last version of the flu virus. So fortunately, COVID does not evolve as fast as the flu, but we'll talk more about this idea of immune escape with COVID here in a little bit. Okay, so there have been a number of variants that have made the news in the last few weeks and months. And the, so these are variants that have mutations that, that make them have possibly have an advantage and so therefore be able to spread more readily. And so they were originally named for the country that they first showed up in. And then the naming system was changed into these Greek letters to avoid confusion because as they spread around the world, they weren't just associated with one country anymore and to reduce the stigma associated with like being from a country that has a, a COVID variant named after it. And so they just switched to Greek letters. And so alpha, beta, gamma, mu, mu, these are all variants of the virus that attracted attention because they were either more contagious or more dangerous or both. But right now the predominant um, variant that is in the news and that's the one that I'm gonna focus on is Delta. So this is the variant that sh showed up in India and that was responsible for those, that big spike in cases and all those headlines about lack of oxygen. It is significantly more contagious than the other variants or the original strain. And we can characterize con um, contagiousness with this number, this symbol called R0. What R0 means is on average, how many people is a sick person likely to infect? And this is assuming an unprotected population. So the original COVID strain had an R0 of around two and a half, which means every sick person on average infected two or three other people if they were in an unprotected population. The Delta strain has an R0 of somewhere between five and nine. 
meaning an individual sick person is much more likely to infect more others than the original strain was. So more than sometimes maybe more than twice as many additional people as the original strain. So that means it's much more transmissible than the original strain of COVID. And we don't know why that is exactly, but it seems to be associated with higher viral loads, that people with Delta seem to make more viruses. And as I said earlier, the more viruses you make, the more likely you are to spread it to other people. Delta is also associated with more severe disease, and that is probably also related to the viral load. But if you have more viral load, you're likely to trigger a, a more out of control immune response and get more damage. We're seeing more breakthrough infections, so more immune escape with Delta than with the other variants. So that means more people who were vaccinated are getting Delta than were getting the original strain. This Delta is now the currently the predominant strain in the United States and in a lot of the world. And so since we're, we're talking about breakthrough infections and, and immune escape, we probably need to review what's actually going on with those vaccines and how they're protecting so that we can really understand what's happening that's allowing Delta to infect people even though they've already been vaccinated. So that's where I'm going next is to talk about how the vaccines work so that we can talk about how Delta can be escaping the vaccines. So most of you, I hope you're all vaccinated. And if you are, probably most of you got one of the messenger RNA vaccines, so Moderna or Pfizer. The messenger RNA vaccines are contain a little piece of instructions for making the spike protein. And they're cleverly packaged in a way that lets th those spike pro those um, instructions get into our cells. So the RNA, the instructions get into our body cells and then our body cells follow those instructions and make the viral spike protein. Not the whole virus, but just the spike protein. And then our immune system says, hey, that's, that's new, that's weird. And it gets busy and makes antibodies against the spike protein. And then the antibodies can bind to the real COVID virus if it ever shows itself and protect us. So that's how Moderna and Pfizer work. Convince our body to make the spike protein, convince our immune system to then produce antibodies against the spike protein, and then have the antibodies then protect us against the real virus. Um, Johnson & Johnson, the other vaccine that's available in the US, works a little differently, although it's still basically the same idea. It's also got the instructions for making the spike protein, only the instructions are DNA instead of RNA, and the instructions are packaged inside another whole virus. Um, it's a, a modified, fairly harmless virus that in any way it's been modified so it can't actually replicate. It's just a packaging for those instructions that lets the instructions get into the cell because viruses are really good at getting into cells. So they put the instructions into a modified harmless virus and let that virus um, get the instructions into the cell. And then that DNA then gets converted into RNA and the RNA gets used to make the spike proteins inside our cells. And then our immune system responds and makes antibodies. So from here on out, it's the same story as happened with the Moderna and Pfizer. Some parts of the world are using just dead coronaviruses as their vaccine. So they're taking the coronavirus and they're inactivating it and then they're just injecting the whole virus. And so the immune system sees this dead virus, makes antibodies against it, regardless of the case, regardless of the technique, the goal for all of these is to get these neutralizing antibodies that can bind to the spike protein and keep the spike protein from being able to interact with our ACE2 receptors. So we call them neutralizing antibodies because they bind to the, the COVID virus and they, um, and they neutralize it and make it ineffective, make it so it can interact with our cells. Um, 
so it, with the vaccines, th these neutralizing antibodies are being made by our immune system. We have also developed um, treatments. We've developed monoclonal, we've developed antibodies in the laboratory. We call it, so these monoclonal antibodies, these are antibodies that are made in laboratories that can be infused into people who have COVID to protect them. So we see vaccines produce antibodies by our immune system. And there's treatments that where labs produce antibodies and then they just give them to us directly. But in both cases, what the antibodies are supposed to do is bind to the spike protein and keep the, the virus from being able to infect our cells. But this has led to some really big questions. The instructions that are in those vaccines for making spike protein are instructions for making the spike protein of the original COVID virus. Do the antibodies that we make still work against other variants like the Delta variant? So that's one really big question. Another big question is, how long do these antibodies stick around in our, in our system? So how long do the vaccines provide protection? And if the answer is not long enough, then would boosters help? Would getting another dose of the vaccine help you make more neutralizing antibodies and provide more protection? So we're starting to have some answers to these big questions. First, we'll look at, at Specifically, we'll look at those monoclonal antibodies because they're the easiest to study in the lab. So this, these two graphs show um, the neutralizing ability of two different monoclonal antibodies. So these are two different medications that are used to treat COVID that are monoclonal antibodies that bind to the spike protein and prevent it from infecting cells. And what we can see is that this particular one on the right, um, if you have even fairly moderate levels of the antibody, you get very high levels of neutralization against all the strains of the virus that they've tested against. So the, this monoclonal antibody on the right is still working against Delta. This one on the left is not. You can see that fairly, even fairly moderate levels of antibodies provide high protection against some strains of COVID, but other strains, including Delta, are not being neutralized by this particular monoclonal antibody. So this medication doesn't work against COVID, even though it worked against the original strain. What this is telling us is some antibodies still work against Delta, but not all antibodies. And when we, when we get infected with COVID or when, when we get a vaccine for COVID, we're, our bodies are making a mix of antibodies, whereas these are made in the lab and they're just one specific antibody. In our bodies, we're getting a mix of antibodies. And what this is suggesting to us is probably some of those antibodies still work against Delta and some of the other antibodies that we made against the original COVID spike don't work against Delta. And since only some of our antibodies work, we're going to need more total antibodies to be protected. Okay. So let's look at some real life data to see how the vaccine is working right now. So on the right here, this shows um, hospitalizations in King County, the so Western Washington. And what we can see I gotta move you guys out of the way. <laughs> what we can see is that um, it, starting in August, Seattle had high levels of people getting hospitalized with severe COVID. This was the Delta strain causing a lot of people to get severe COVID and get hospitalized. But almost all of them were not fully vaccinated. The gray line here at the bottom is the hospitalizations in vaccinated people. And you can see it's barely budged that the vast majority of people in Seattle who were getting severe COVID, the vast majority of them that were showing up in the hospitals are the unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated people. And so this is saying, look, 
the vaccines are, are still working even against the COVID strain, at least for severe disease. And that's of course the most important thing about vaccines is that we, we it would be great if they kept us from getting sick at all, but what we really want them to do is keep us from getting badly sick and needing hospital to be hospitalized and possibly dying. And this says that um, so far so good in at least in Seattle against the Delta strain. We get a slightly different story if we go to Israel. Oops. So it, the data from Israel is broken out by age group. And we see a couple of things. One, we see the, the orange, like the red lines are the um, severe COVID in unvaccinated people. And the green is severe COVID in fully vaccinated people. And we can see a couple of things. We can see that most people getting severe COVID are not vaccinated. So the vaccines are pr providing some protection, probably quite a lot of protection. We're also seeing though, especially in these older age groups, some severe COVID showing up in people who are fully vaccinated. So this is suggesting that at least in older individuals, vaccination is not fully protective against the Delta strain. Now there could be two things going on here. Um, one is it might be that the older you are, the less efficient your immune system is. And so you're not making as many antibodies. And so you're not responding as well to the vaccine and, and therefore you're more likely to get um, breakthrough infections. And that's almost certainly some of what's going on. But the other thing is Israel was one of the first countries to really get their act together with vaccination and got, had high levels of vaccination before almost anywhere else in the world. And they started vaccinating the oldest people first. And so a lot of these older individuals, it's been a while since they were vaccinated. So it might be, it's not, it might be at least in part, not that their immune systems aren't doing as good a job. It might be that it's just been a longer time since they've had the vaccine. And so there, if the vaccine loses efficacy over time, we would expect to see that show up first in places like Israel that vaccinated early and first in older individuals because they got the first shot. And so, um, and some of the data from Israel does suggest that, that if you look within an age group, those people that got vaccinated earliest are more likely to get hospitalized than people who were vaccinated later. And that led Israel to institute booster shots. And they found that getting a third shot greatly reduced the number of hospitalizations within any age group. And so that led the FDA in September 17th, so this is back in the United States, based primarily on that Israel data to, to authorize a third dose of Pfizer for people who are 65 or older or have other conditions that would make them at risk for severe COVID. There was a lot of question and debate about whether it would be reasonable to provide boosters to other individuals, to younger individuals. And um, it may very well be that it would help. The problem is that it becomes something of an ethical question, that in a world where there's still limited supplies of vaccines, we know that most younger individuals are still fairly well protected against severe COVID. And even if a third dose might increase their protection a little more, is that the best use of limited doses? When if you look at this map, you can see there's parts of the world where almost nobody has, has had any doses at all. Um, and that's probably partly why, why the FDA only approved a third dose for the people who are at more serious risk, um, because really it's probably not fair to give extra doses to people who are reasonably well protected when there's still large areas of the world that don't have any protection at all. The ethical issue here will get better over time because there are new, va new vaccines that are still coming online and existing approved vaccines are continuing to ramp up production. And so eventually there will be enough doses for everyone. 
And then probably it will make sense for everyone to get a third dose. What we don't yet know is whether a third dose will then protect you for life or whether you'll need yet another dose in another year or so. There are other vaccine regimens for other diseases that are just three dose shots where you need three doses and then you have long time protection. And that might be the way the vaccines for COVID work is it might just be that you need three and then you're good. Or it might be that protection declines and that you need you keep need to getting a booster dose. And we won't know that until it's been longer since people got the third dose. So in another year or so, we'll probably have a sense of whether a third, it's the third dose and then you really are done, or whether it's a, like the flu where you'll need a booster every year. Um, there has been some interest in making a, a vaccine that's specific for the Delta variant, because right now we're still giving people instructions for making that original spike protein. Um, could we make a vaccine that was instructions for making the Delta version of that spike protein? The answer is yes, it wouldn't be that difficult. Like all the hard work of developing COVID vaccines, you know, that huge scientific push to get vaccines developed very rapidly, like all that hard work has already been done and it would not be hard to switch it out a little bit and have the instructions for making the Delta spike protein um, instead of the original strain. The problem is that Delta may not be the last variant. <laughs> and the Dr. Fauci has described trying to keep modifying the vaccines as, as engaging in a game of whack-a-mole that you, you make a new vaccine for whatever new variant happens to be present. And then pretty soon another variant pops up. And so then you're trying to tinker with the vaccine to make it against that variant and, and it becomes a game of whack-a-mole. So what he is really hoping um, we can get, we can do is that there is by just by boosting our overall antibody levels what, with booster shots, even though some of them won't work against the, the, any particular strain, that if we have enough total antibodies that will be protected against a wide variety of strains um, without having to tinker with the vaccines to make them specific for each strain. And so far that seems to be working. That, probably a booster shot gives you enough additional antibodies that you have high levels of protection against um, at least all the variants we know about so far. All right, I wanna talk a little bit more about um, the significance of your of infectious dose, of how many viruses you're actually getting and how that impacts how sick you are. So if you get an, a low initial dose, so you were exposed to just a few viral particles. Probably what happens is you get a few cells in your lungs and elsewhere infected, and that triggers a sort of moderate immune response that successfully clears the virus without causing that um, cytokine storm of damage of an overactive immune system. If you get a high initial dose of virus, that seems much more likely to infect a bunch of cells and really call forth a really radical immune response that can produce that cytokine storm that leads to a lot of damage. So it's pretty clear if you're gonna get COVID-19, it would be way better to get exposed to just a few particles than it would be to get exposed to a lot of particles. And this is the logic behind masking. Masks do not prevent all COVID particles, but they reduce the number. And since um, COVID-19 is a little unusual in that people are, seem to be reach peak infectiveness often before they have actually any symptoms, um, a lot of the people that are walking around out there that are infected don't know it and they're putting out viral particles. If they're wearing a mask, they're putting out fairly few viral particles. If they're not masked, they're putting out significantly more viral particles. So even though the mask doesn't keep them all in, it reduces the number of viral particles that are out there. And then 
similarly, if you're wearing a mask, that doesn't block you from getting exposed to all viral particles, but it does reduce the number that you're getting exposed to. And so masking will reduce the likelihood of people getting severe COVID. Because by dropping the number of viruses that are out there, it makes it much more likely that people who do get infected will get mild disease because they only got exposed to a fewer to fewer numbers of viruses. Masks, wearing masks is a public health good because it's protecting not just you, but also other people. Because if you're, if you're infected and you're wearing a mask, you're not spewing as many viruses. And if you're not infected and you're wearing a mask, you're not gonna get exposed to as many viruses. And so masking um, becomes a, a public good and that has, that's what's behind the mask mandates in indoor spaces. Um, and we've seen pushback on that by people who feel like it's, it's impinging on their personal liberties. But the reason why there are mandates for masks is because it reduces the chance of people getting severe COVID. <laughs> Vaccines also help reduce viral load because if you are, in, if you're vaccinated and you're infected, you're probably at least partially protected. I mean, you got vaccinated, so you, you have at least some protection. And so you're probably making a lot fewer viruses than if you're unvaccinated. And so like the masks, getting vaccinated protects not just you, but also the larger community. Because if you're vaccinated, even if you do get infected, you're not as likely to spread it to other individuals. And if you do spread it to under, and other individuals, they're not, li not likely to get as sick because they're getting a smaller dose of virus from if they're getting it from a vaccinated person than if they're getting it from an unvaccinated person. And so this is the logic behind vaccine mandates. This is why federal employees need to be vaccinated. This is why healthcare workers need to be vaccinated and teachers need to be vaccinated. Um, it's not just to protect the teachers and the federal employees. It's also as part of this larger picture of protecting other people um, from getting the large dose of viruses that could occur if somebody was unvaccinated and, and infected. So if you're gonna hang out with, with other people, hang out with vaccinated people. It will help protect you from getting severe COVID. And that wraps up what I was gonna share. And I think I have plenty of time for questions. So I will um, answer anything I can. Okay, if you wanna ask a question, just unmute yourself and let Claire know. Um, I just have a comment. I wanted to say my background is microbiology and immunology and Claire's talks was excellent. You did an amazing job. <laughs> oh, thank you, I appreciate that. That means a lot. I, the challenge is always to be both, um, have it be both simple enough to be understandable without making it not true. So I appreciate you saying that I, I managed to hit that, that place. Yes. Thank you, Claire. This is Monica. Oh, you're welcome. It was great. <laughs> I learned something. <laughs> yeah, what I like best, Claire, is even though some of the things that um, you mentioned today, you've mentioned in previous talks, it just helps reorganize it in my mind. And it helps me when you're using all that correct terminology, it, it just helps me think about it better. Um, so I really appreciate uh, talk number three. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Delma, you're, you're, you're muted. You have to unmute. There you go. And we do, we tend to hang out with our friends and we know that our friends have all been uh, vaccinated. 
but many of us have workers who come to our homes. And is there any group among them we must be wary of? And how do we handle it? Do you ask people if they've been vaccinated? How do we handle it? What is the way to do this? <laughs> to move among people who might not be vaccinated? Any ideas? <laughs> not really. We do know that, that um, you know, larger businesses are going to be re are required to, to vaccinate to, for employees to be vaccinated. And um, so you could use that as a screening process, probably. Um, you could ask. <laughs> uh huh. Because the older we are, probably the more people we're exposed to who come in to help us. Yeah, so we, one other possibility, Delma, is if we wear a mask, that sends a signal to whoever comes in. First of all, it protects us to a certain extent. And it also sends a signal to somebody that we're concerned about that. That's right. I've had this situation where when I wore a mask, other people put theirs on. That's right. That's right. And I, yeah. I do that with my house, house worker. <laughs> and you can always ask somebody to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I found if you make the question one that sounds like a curiosity rather than a tack. And uh -huh. where I'm across this is when I volunteer at the plaid door. Um, you know, we make people, um, we make people wear masks there and we're wearing the mask and we've got the mask right there by the front door. And most people, if you even just stare at them and they see the mask, there, and they don't already have one on, they'll pick it up. But I question, uh, oh, did you get Pfizer or Moderna? You know, which one is a less offensive question than saying, are you vaccinated? Yeah. Because the first question kind of creates a curiosity and, and, and actually the ones who enjoy the question the most because people love to say, no, I didn't get either one. I got Johnson and Johnson. <laughs> and it, it makes it a conversation about what's going on rather than an attack. And, and I've, I've used that pretty successfully about three or four times. Good. I like the idea of having um, some masks by your front door also. I think that's mm -hmm. that be a handy idea. Mm -hmm. And I noticed in some people that did come in without an, a mask and like one lady in particular, when we gave her one, she wasn't that old either, like 30 something. It was very, very appreciative. We gave her this mask and I was kind of picturing, you know, there's households where other people are so anti-mask that if you went out and bought yourself some fancy masks, you get a lot of flack from them. Mm -hmm. And so like this one gal, she wanted to walk through the store with her consignment items. And I said, are you vaccinated? She's not actually, and I said, well, and so my coworker just ran over and handed her this mask. And, and she was so grateful. She said, oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, in a sort of educated rule, it, it makes sense, you know, we get praised for masking up, but there are people in our community who live in situations where they get criticized for wearing masks. So <clears throat> to have them available so you can just give them, well, I got this for free, I'm going to wear it, um, I think is helpful. Sure. <clears throat> is there any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Yeah, Dennis. Yeah. Clara, it was an excellent presentation. I really appreciate it. it reinforced a lot of things for all of us, I'm sure. I'm, I, we're getting bombarded with information on COVID and vaccinations. I have one rumor. I, well, I actually heard it on the radio. And to see if you can verify if it, any validity to it. The, it was, a statement was made in Africa. The And I couldn't tell. If, it looked like in your charts there, the Africa what had a lower uh, rate of... Uh, getting a COVID. And he said it's because they take the malaria drug that 
protects them from getting COVID. Do you have any validity to that or heard that kind of rumor? Um, <laughs> there are some mal malaria drugs that are being evaluated as anti-COVID medications. It's too okay. soon to say whether they're wor working or not. Um, okay. I don't think that's the explanation for why parts of Africa have been spared some of the COVID pandemic. Um, I think we may, I think it's probably, there's probably a lot of different explanations for what's going on in Africa. Some of it might be it's a much younger continent, so they may be getting a lot less symptomatic infections because we know that younger people tend to get less, uh, less likely to be symptomatic. It may be that there's a lot of other diseases circulating and that some of those might provide cross protection or just a, a, a very heightened immune surveillance that jumps on the COVID-19 more readily. It might be that there's a lot of um, hidden infections because they're not testing as much because there's just less well-developed infrastructure. I seriously doubt it's because there's a lot of people taking anti-malarial medications. I don't okay. think that's likely to be the explanation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But I really like your statement about the idea that if you live, there's places in Africa where you can live and people are constantly getting bombarded with way more virus and bacterial attacks than we are. And so their immune system is like already on high alert. And if they're older and more vulnerable, for some reason, they probably already died. So, you know, the population that's less to be attacked is more prepared and younger. Great. Any other questions for Claire? Because we promised her she could leave at five and we're getting close to the, we're over five. Um, Anyone last questions? No. Nope. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Claire. That was yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. But this is going to be, if you missed any parts of it or if you want to review them, uh, Chrissy's going to send you the link to the website. Um, so we really appreciate this, Claire. It's fantastic. You're welcome. It's been lots of fun. Thanks for having me back. Awesome. All right.